on, let's worship the King of Kings.
Yeah, I just didn't want to leave that place this morning. Uh, but hey, we're going to continue our giving, our, our worship through the, through the giving of tithes and offerings. Uh, if you're new, we don't pass the baskets. We have life boxes located here in the back out in the lobby. You can also give online. You can text to give. You can give on our website. Or also, you can get our church app, which I highly, highly recommend. You go to the Apple Store or the Google Store, whichever one applies, and you download our church app, Mountain Life Church McCall. It has our sermons, our resources. You can give online. It has what's happening. We do, te- we do push notifications for cool things that are happening and prayer requests and all of the above. I highly recommend it. Uh, but for, hey, but listen, for us uh, giving in this season, you know, God has demonstrated his faithfulness in so many ways. Just today, I heard of two brand new entrepreneurs in this room that God has blessed them and set them out. Uh, I'm not going to call you out and embarrass you. Uh, you know who you are. Um, but listen, that is just the favor of God on your life. And you know, time and time and again, God's, God proves his faithfulness. But you know, in the area of financing, finances, it's the one area God says that we can test him in. The one area. You know, you've, you've heard it elsewhere, thou shalt not test the Lord your God, but God himself in Malachi said, test me in this. In other words, you cannot outgive God. And if you trust God with this area of your life, um, God will take care of you and bless you. And I know there's at least two of you in the room that, that God is doing incredible things in your business. I've heard testimonies this last week of doing incredible stuff. What God is doing on the mission field, Mountain Life Church abroad, is incredible through our finances. Just one month from now, we're getting ready to do wood stock, our, our wood cutting day, where we do about 100 cords of wood and send it out. And by the way, church, you already have given your contribution for the, for the year and then some, and there's some others in the community that haven't been able to do that. Um, and because of your faithfulness, your giving, um, you're making a way for others in the community who wouldn't be able to do it to participate in Woodstock. And listen, that's just the faithfulness of God. So, Father, we just thank you, God. Yeah, you can clap and give God a clap and a shout for his faithfulness. Uh, but, God, we just thank you today. So, Lord, I just pray, God, that, that, that as we just agree with you, as we test you in this area, as we, as we give our, our jobs, our finances, our homes, our, all of our stuff, Lord, as we entrust it all to you, Lord, we know that there is no safer, more secure place. But God, we also praise you today that you have blessed us abundantly in so many ways. So today, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would bless each giver in this room and bless the gift. And Lord, that you would continue to advance your kingdom and change the world in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give however you choose to. A um, couple of quick things. If you're a guest with us today, uh, there are Connect cards located at the Life Boxes. Um, you, can, you can also communicate with us again through our app or online. But that Connect card will let us know that you are here. We'll get those that early this week. We'll pray if you have a specific prayer request. We'll pray for you if you want to meet with a pastor or talk to somebody. You can put that down also. But it helps us to know that you were, that you were here and how we can serve you. You can take that and you can put it in one of the live boxes. Uh, you can also... Next week, I shouldn't tell you to hold on to it, but if you drop one in the box this week, next week, go tell them in the coffee shop when it's open, uh, and they will give you a free cup of coffee uh, for turning in your Connect card. But it's a great way for us just to, to be able to connect with you. We're so glad that you're with us today. Uh, and then also, finally, uh, June uh, is our month at the food bank, and it is an incredible ministry. Uh, we'll share more on mission than our next mission Sunday about our local missions. Uh, but June is the month where we all sign up to go serve on Wednesdays um, at the food bank. We need three volunteers. We're teaming up with another church in the community. We need three volunteers per Wednesday for the month of June. Dawn has a clipboard right here. She's going to pass it around. Um, if you have not served at the food bank, I highly recommend you give it a shot. It is an incredible blessing, and you'll be surprised how many people in the community you serve, church. Even, even if you've never been at the food bank before, you'll be shocked 
at the hundreds of people that you touch every week through our food bank ministry. And it's a great opportunity to get to be hands-on in serving and loving on people. Okay, we're going to let the middle school go at this time. If you're a guest with us and you're in middle school, follow this guy. This is Cole. Uh, They're going to room two right now, and they're going to get the word of God. Once upon a time, there was a great wind, a mighty life-giving energy that breathed everything into existence, a power that moved along the waters of the deep, the Spirit of God. One day, a group who loved God was praying and meeting, celebrating a Jewish feast with friends and family, unaware of what was going to happen. Heaven was about to pay a visit. A violent wind filled the room where they prayed. Tongues of fire descended, separated, and rested on each of them. The Spirit of God didn't just come near them. The Spirit filled them. And each one began to speak in a foreign language, the many languages of all the people who lived in Jerusalem. All those who passed by marveled at what they saw. How could it be that each one could hear their own native language at the same time? Some claimed it was miraculous. Others scoffed and called them drunk. But Peter stepped forward and boldly proclaimed the truth. What the scripture described long ago had now come to pass right before their eyes. I will pour out my spirit, the Lord told his people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Here was the moment. The power of God filled the faithful. The body of Christ rose up, alive and active, equipped and empowered to love God, to love others. The good news continues to be proclaimed. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the best news is, for those who believe, the story never ends. Come on, happy Pentecost Sunday. Uh, if you're new and you're like, Pentecost, what is that? I want to I share in a little bit uh, what that means uh, for those that have been around you know exactly, or maybe you might know exactly what that means. Open your Bibles to Joel chapter 2. Well, that was pretty good. Joel chapter 2. Hey, if you're going to be weird and do it, just do it, right? Um, No, it's not weird. It's awesome. Um, uh, And then also Acts chapter 2. So you can keep your finger on Acts chapter 2 and turn to Joel chapter 2. We just had it on the screen, but we're going to go ahead and read it. Uh, today, I want, to, uh, I want to actually begin us in, uh, I won't call it a series because it was kind of broken up a little bit. We have a special Sunday next week. It's Family Sunday. Uh, you want to bring the kids, the whole family next week. We're going to have a f- special family service followed by a family barbecue. Uh, we've got the meat and the drinks, and uh, Chef Bobby is going to grill up, barbecue up some great stuff. You bring a side dish. Um, you can actually, on our uh, we sent out a newsletter this last week, and also on the app and on the web page, you can also sign up just to let us know what side dish you want to bring, or just bring one. Uh, that would be fine, too. Uh, we're going to have a great time next week uh, just hanging out, and, uh, and our kids program is going to bring what they do right in here with us. They're going to worship with us. We're going to get a word. Uh, we might even have some young people again up on the worship team. It's going to be awesome. Um, yes, pastor's going to be on the worship team, young people. Um, Oh, come on, that was funny. Um, and, then, uh, and then the following week, we have special guest, uh, Bob Sorge, who's going to be with us um, for uh, a one Sunday morning or one service only. Uh, if you don't know Bob, uh, we sent out information in our newsletter, also app and our website, our webpage as well, that has information about God, about Bob. He's an incredible man of God. Slow down, Joe. 
Um, and uh, you don't want to miss it. Uh, he's also an incredible author. A couple of his books have been hugely instrumental for us as a church. Uh, that's coming up the week after next, June 6th. Uh, you don't want to miss that. That would be another one, a good one to bring your friends to. And then following that, uh, in the month of June, we're going to continue on with, uh, with a little bit of a theme of what we're, what we're talking and experiencing about today. Joel chapter 2. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. On who? All flesh. Come on, if you're going to say it, say all, all. all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. So Pastor Sean is getting dreams, and I'm getting some incredible visions. Um, okay. Um, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Come on, church, what is up today? You're just too caught up in the spirit to laugh at my silly jokes. Uh, and also, my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Ah, what an incredible prophecy. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it goes on to say that Others in the area that because of the festival, because of the feast, um, the town was packed full of people from all over the then known world. And uh, many believers had come to the area for this, for this feast. Just 50 days ago, they had, they had been there for the Passover. And you know what happened with, with Jesus there that weekend. And then now 50 days later, they're back for another feast, the Feast of, uh, of Pentecost, or there's some other names for it as well. Uh, and they're all in the area, and the scripture says that many came to check it out what the noise was. So let me just pause right there for a moment. This occurrence that we just read on the day of Pentecost was not subtle. It wasn't subdued. It wasn't quiet. In fact, some probably thought it wasn't very orderly. In fact, uh, many came to see what was happening because there was a wind that blew through the place that shook things up and made noise. There were tongues of fire coming down on them. It's dividing them. And they all began to speak in other tongues and other languages. And listen, and if, if you think a crowd in a city during the time of festival will come because there's no noise or because it's quiet or because there's something subtle, oh, hey, you know, I'm not really sure if anything is going on. There was something obvious happening in this place. As the earth shook and the spirit of the living God came and descended on people and God fulfilled his promise. Many came and of course as we as you know um, <clears throat> many were astounded and many mocked and they said oh they must be drunk, they must be weird, they must be oh you know those charismaniacs, you know, those Pentecostals. There must be something wrong with those guys. People came and mocked. And then Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, stands up and he begins to preach. And he says these words. He says, brothers, I'll paraphrase, we're not drunk. It's just in the morning. And some would say, what difference does that make? It's just in the, oh, then you need to be here. If you said that, you need to be here this morning. He says, brothers, we are not drunk. This is that which was promised by the prophet Joel. This is that. If you're taking notes today, the title of our sermon is, This is That. See, the prophet had prophesied, and, and all who were faithful, all who studied the word, understood and knew this and knew this word. There had been a promise that this day would happen, but also John the Baptist, Jesus himself, 
prophets of old had prophesied about what was happening in these days. First with Jesus back on the Passover. Jesus becoming the sacrificial lamb. So once and for all, die for the atonement of our sins. To break the power of sin off of our lives. But that was only part of the picture. That was only part of the promise. And on this day, 50 days later, is the fulfillment of this promise from from Joel, as well as promises that Jesus had made. And what does Pentecost mean? And I don't want to spend too much time exhausting this, but Pentecost simply means 50 or 50 days. And the significance of 50 days is it's the day after seven weeks. Seven weeks had been accomplished. Now, if you don't understand numbers in scripture, the number seven is the, often the number of completion. Well, Jesus and others would, would use that number. And if you multiplied seven by seven, it was like done, mature, complete, finished. And Pentecost came after Acts 2 says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, in other words, seven times seven was fully completed. When the day of maturity had arrived, when the day of completion, the day of fulfillment had arrived, the Holy Spirit came. What an incredible thing if you think about it. Now, the the day of Pentecost is not new starting in, in Acts. In fact, the day of Pentecost, it was, it was a day that was celebrated. It represented 50 days after the people of Israel were brought out of Egypt. 50 days after the Passover, when they, took, they slaughtered the lamb and they took the blood of the lamb and they put it over the top of the doorpost so that death would pass over their homes. You probably know the story. And then after, after they were delivered from death, Then God led them out with Moses, led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea on dry ground. And 50 days later, God brought them to himself at a mount called Horeb, and he invited them up. And as as the scripture says, he invited them all, and he told Moses, tell the people, prepare themselves, because in a couple days, we're going to meet face to face. And at that time, the Spirit of God God himself, the creator of the universe, descended and spoke to the people. See, many don't realize this, but the first time the Ten Commandments were given to the people, the very first time the law was spoken, it wasn't on tablets. It was God speaking directly, his voice, to the ears of the people. And at that time, the people heard his voice, and they, 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 they saw the signs and the earth shaking and how magnificent and scary and and awe-inspiring and fearful and all of those things that it must have been like at that moment. And they said, no, Moses, you talk to God for us because if we hear for ourselves, we'll surely die. And then because the people were more concerned about self-preservation than responding to the voice of God, this relationship began where they had a mediator. See, God's intent was never that they would have a mediator. God's intent was to deliver them, to set them free, to free them from death, to deliver them at the Passover, to bring them through the sea, to bring them to the mountain so he himself could speak to them and have a relationship with them. But then the people weren't ready. So God continued to use Moses and others, priests, which were established late, much later on to, to, uh, to be the mediator or to the, be the spokesperson between man and God, but, but God's initial intent and in his promise. In fact, in Exodus chapter 19, when he's setting it all up, he says, I will be your God. I'm paraphrasing. There's two places. It's in 6 and in 19. And he says, I will be your God and you'll be my people. And God makes this statement in Exodus 19, verse 5. He says, Now therefore, if you indeed will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Anybody recognize that phrase? 
These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So God is telling Moses to tell the people, if you listen to my word and you obey me, you'll be set apart. You'll be mine. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. And you'll be a kingdom of kings and priests. Well, what happened after that? We know the history, if we read the Old Testament, that they ended up having kings to be the king. And they ended up having priests to mediate (coughs) between them and God. But God's intention was always for his people to be the ones who were set apart to be the kings and to be the priests. And then we have the promise on the day of what we would call the day of Pentecost that we just read from Acts chapter 2. The New Testament promises, Mark chapter 1 verse 8, John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 16, Jesus speaking, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. John 15, verse 26, Jesus again, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16, hey Pat, I'm kind of ringing here, can you help me out? Luke eleven thirteen. 13, now, much more, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And just to paraphrase, so Jesus is, is telling His disciples, I'm going to the Father. In fact, at one point He says, It's good that I go, because if I go, the Father can send the promise, He can send the Spirit. In fact, Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans when I go. They were. They were distressed and they were sad because Jesus is saying, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to raise again. I won't be with you guys anymore. And they were sad. And he said, don't, don't fret. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not, not going to leave you as orphans because the comforter is going to come. He's promising the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, Jesus He commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And again, Acts chapter 2, we just read, when Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come and they were all in one place. So here we have this day of the fulfillment of these promises, promises of the Old Testament, promises of of John the Baptist and of Jesus. And in fact, Jesus, after his death, burial, and resurrection, meets with them and again promises and says, you guys wait, because someone, not something, someone is coming. And he will, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will endue you with power. I love the fact that the the terminology that's used there is power isn't just like, oh, you're going to feel good. The the power is like deutimus means dynamite. It's explosive. It's it's not quiet and subdued and subtle. Um, Just kind of a little side note. The whole idea that spirit-filled living is quiet and subdued and supposed to be between you and God is absolutely unbiblical. Jesus promised to his disciples, he says, I'm not leaving you alone. Because they're like, Jesus, you're the guy. You're the one everyone would listen to. And you're the one who walked on water. You're the one who did the miracles. You're the one that did all this stuff. And uh, and if you go, I, and, you, and you're telling us to go preach the good news, no way. We are not qualified. Anybody else feel like that? How am I supposed to go preach the gospel? Jesus, if they didn't listen to you, how are they going to listen to me? Jesus, if you went through all that, how am I ever going to do this? And Jesus said, when he comes, he will empower you to be my witnesses. See, when he says he wasn't going to leave his people alone, his promise wasn't just that, hey, someone's going to come and do it again for you. Someone is going to come and do it through you. And this day, by the way, is the birth of the church. Why didn't the church start the day after Jesus resurrected? 
I mean, couldn't they have just started then? Couldn't they have just gone and told the story? You see, there was something significant. In fact, God knew, being God, God knew that the only way that they would make it, the only way that this would happen, and the only way that the promises all the way back in, that we just read in Exodus, and all the way back to Abraham, the only way these promises would be fulfilled is if God himself came and filled. You know, the word baptism means to be immersed. It doesn't mean to be sprinkled. It doesn't mean to, like, put your tiptoe in. It means whoosh, dunked, immersed, consumed, enveloped, is what this word baptize mean, means. And when John said it and Jesus said it, John baptized with water, but I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What's that mean? You're going to be immersed. You're going to be not just filled, not just sprinkled, not just, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm saved and I've got, no. Listen, there is a dynamic, almost a violent implication about this immersion, which is why on the day of Pentecost, it was a violent thing. The Spirit of the living God coming down from heaven and pouring out on God's people, doing what he promised all the way back in Exodus. I will be your God and you will be my people. And you will be a holy people set apart from everyone else. You will be my kingdom of kings and priests. In other words, you don't need a mediator. You don't need someone to talk to God for you. You don't need a pastor to talk to God for you. You don't need a prophet. You don't need a priest. You don't, you don't need anyone else. You don't need that self-help person or that book. The spirit of the living God is going to come and dwell with you the same way that he descended on Mount Horeb to be the people, to have personal relationship. The spirit of the living God on the day of Pentecost came down to the church so that you and I can face to face. And you know what? We say face-to-face, but what's more intimate, face-to-face or in you? See, we say we want to see God, but God wants to dwell in you. We We say, Holy Spirit, come. Well, where was he? See, at this moment, the game changed. Instead of God occasionally coming on the special person, the certain person, the the priest, the prophet, the king, the whoever, that, that person like we had in the Old Testament, on this day the game changed to where now the Spirit of God comes into the believer. Who? The believer. And makes the believer who was a sinner, who was a slave to sin, who was broken, who was hurt, who, who had a past, who had all sorts of stuff, who, who was alienated from God, who before that couldn't talk to God or hear from God themselves and didn't have the power some days to even get out of bed, now has the same power that rose Jesus from the dead residing inside of them. And this is the day that the church became the church. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is not only saved, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and is saved is endued with the power of the Holy Spirit. So pastor, how come I don't feel like I have much power? We're going to explore this in a couple weeks, but so I'll just leave it at that. I'm just kidding. But you know, the apostles came across uh, Sometime after this, the apostles came across people who had heard the gospel preached. And, and they said, uh, when, you, when you believed in Jesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they, and they said, we don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. And then they laid hands on them. And, and scripture says that the Spirit came on them and they began to prophesy and speak in tongues. See, things began to happen. And there were these subsequent things that began to happen. It wasn't just this subtle little, oh, I think I'm okay. Listen, when God himself comes on your life, there is a marked difference. And the problem is, the lie of the world is you should keep it to yourself. 
This never happened to keep it to yourself. This happened so that there would be a clear delineation between light and dark. That there would be a clear delineation between God's people and not God's people. And not so that the not God's people would be set aside and cast away, but so those who weren't God's would be drawn to become his. You see, back in Exodus, God was only drawing Israel, the Hebrews, to himself. On the day of Pentecost, God began to draw all people because in Joel it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All flesh. Who is that for? Well, there's a hint here. Peter gets up and he preaches and he tells this whole story and gets, every, gets everyone to understand who Jesus was and why he had to come and why he had to die and that he rose again. And then it, scripture says that they were all cut to the heart, which by the way, we preachers don't preach this conviction as good as we should sometimes. Scripture says that without godly sorrow, there's no repentance. In other words, if your sin doesn't break your heart, you won't turn from your sin. And it says that they were cut to the heart. They were poised and they said, brothers, what must we do to be saved? Peter says, repent. Sounds a little bit like the Passover. Have your Sin cleansed. Have your sin washed away. Be baptized. Sounds a little bit like coming through the, through the Red Sea, being delivered from bondage. And he said, and receive the Holy Spirit. Repent, be baptized, and receive the Spirit. The full package, the full promise, the seven times seven, the, the, the day of fullness, the significance of this happening on this day and not just, oh, we'll just believe or just tack on Jesus or, or just come be baptized and then everything will be okay. No, repent, be baptized, and receive the full package. Why would you buy a sports car without the engine? Why would you just stop halfway? God never stops halfway. Isaiah 61, but you shall be called priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. This was thousands of years before this day. Thousands and thousands before today. And yet this is the word over God's people. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. Exodus 19.6 again, and you shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And a future promise in Revelation 1.6, and he made us a kingdom priest to his God and, and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. This church is God's promise over us. Would you stand to your feet? And Peter goes on to say, repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and for your children and for their children. And for all who will believe. So there, see, there's an idea out there that what happened on the day of Pentecost stopped sometime back in the book of Acts. Or sometime after the book of Acts was written. Like somehow God stopped pouring out his spirit. That somehow this just happened so that people would get the Bible or so that the church would grow. But listen, why would God ever find it necessary for them to wait for his spirit and then take his spirit away. Has not. Has not. And you, in fact, you can't read what we just read in Revelations and believe that that's the case. If the spirit of God came into the life of the believer on the day of Pentecost, then the spirit of God comes into the life of the believer the day they receive him. Repent, be baptized, 
and receive. You bow your heads with me, and I don't normally do this, but I'll do it again today. Just close your eyes with me. Jesus said, if you, being a wicked person, wouldn't give their child something bad if they asked for something good, how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit when you ask? You know, the references to Paul time and time again telling the disciples, telling the churches, be filled. The, the, the phrase that he used to be filled was a continuation. Be being filled. Stay filled. But he would say, but be filled, praying in the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it is, it is critical, it is essential for you and I to be the fulfillment. God gave the law on the first day of Pentecost On the second Pentecost, he fulfilled it by sending his spirit to give you the power to obey, to fulfill, to walk it out, to be living examples, to no longer walk according to the flesh, but to walk according to the spirit. And he gave you the power to be witnesses. Listen, God has already been in this place today. But if you're like me and you're here today and you say, Holy Spirit, I need more. I need more of you. With eyes closed, would you just put your hand up if that's you? I just need more. I just want more. God, if there's more, I want it. God, if there's more for me, I want it. God, if there's more power for me to overcome the things of this world, I want it. God, if there is more gifting in order for me to do what you've called me to do, then I want it. God, if there's, if there's more stuff, I need it. God, I can't even produce the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I can't even produce that without you. So why would I not need or want more? You might say, well, pastor, if I already have the Holy Spirit, why do I need more? All we're simply saying is we're using English to say, God, I don't want you to hold anything back. I want everything you have. And scripture also tells us that it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. It's possible to resist the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's possible to reject the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, many, because of teaching, because of experience, or because of bad experiences with weird people, they've rejected and resisted the Holy Spirit. Listen, can we just let God be God? let him manifest how he wants to. If he wants to move in you a certain way, shouldn't we just say okay? If he wants to do something in you, shouldn't we just say okay? So Lord, just as we read, Lord, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit on us in a new and fresh way. That you pour out your spirit on all, all, all that are here. God, we need your strength to overcome. Or the things that we prayed to break off earlier, we need your spirit for that. God, to produce the fruit of the spirit, we need that. Lord, to be able to do the the impossible things that need to happen in the world out there that is dying and is in trouble without you, Lord. The only way we can go and preach the gospel, to preach the good news, the only way we can be a light on a hill is with the power of your spirit operating in our lives. So Lord, would you come? So would you come? If you rose your hand, would you just say that with me? Holy Spirit, come. Fill me fresh. Fill me new. Hold nothing back. Hold nothing back. And I want to pray over you and let you go. Kids Church is waiting for the parents to come. But if you would like to receive prayer, if you would like to have someone 
just pray with you. And the scripture talks time and time again about the laying on of hands by the leaders and people receiving a baptism, a filling of the Holy Spirit, a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we believe in that. Um, it's not something we're going to force or put on anyone. It's whatever you want. And listen, if it's not that, if you want someone to pray with you and just agree with you or anything at all, um, Kathy is right here. She's our prayer leader. Uh, we have some other prayer folks that will respond if you come to the altar as well. But I want to invite you to come and receive prayer today. So Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you, God, that you held nothing back when you sent your son to die on a cross for us. And you held nothing back when you sent your spirit to dwell and inhabit your people. So God, I just pray that you would fill us fresh today that you'd fill us anew. And Lord, as we walk out these doors, we would walk out changed. We would walk out empowered. We would walk out enabled. Lord, that we would get the spiritual upgrade that you intended when you said it's complete. It's done. It's done. So Lord, would you do that in us today and this week? And Lord, empower your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, would you give God a shout and a clap again? Come on, he's good and he's worthy. Have an awesome day. If you want prayer for anything or if you want someone just to pray and agree with you, please come on up. We have some other altar ministry folks that will come and join you up here as well. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.